<laughs> and this initial event was a big bang. Was, any physicist here will beat me up if I say it's an explosion. But just, just pretend it's a metaphor, okay? And there's a lot of heat, and so there's this huge expansion of heat and complexity that's going on in the universe. Uh, and so they made this hypothesis, and then what they did is uh, they did the next step, which is let's make calculations. Let's predict what we have to see. And what they, they predicted is that if there was this huge expansion that occurred 13 million years ago, uh, there ought to be traces of it left. There ought to be background radiation, background heat scattered to the universe that's a remnant of the Big Bang. And they could even predict the distribution of energies of this kind of heat. And they did it, and then they did the measurements of radio telescopes and so forth, and lo and behold, they match. So it's a beautiful example of science describing the real world. Accurate, mathematic, physical. But the key thing I, I just want to get across here is this idea that, that this big event left a scattering of information in the universe. This heat, that like the remnants of the Big Bang, it turns out that evolution has also left these interesting remnants. And I'm going to talk specifically about what's going on in protists. So protists are single-celled eukaryotic animals. So much simpler than we are. And we are self-centered creatures, right? So we tend to think of events like the Cambrian explosion as events that produced us. So the Cambrian explosion is an event that occurred about 500 million years ago. And like the Big Bang, it really wasn't an explosion. It was stretched out over 10 to 20 million years. It was a, a period of time when uh, many forms diversified and finally produced many new forms of organisms, including multicellular organisms like us, that were initially fairly simple, got more and more complex over this period of time. Now, if you, if you take this kind of retrospective view of history and say, well, the Cambrian explosion is something that produced us, you're thinking incorrectly. It wasn't. The Cambrian explosion was an event that produced a great diversity of forms and that built on prior diversity that was present before the explosion we see. Uh, where that diversity lies is in the protists. There are all these single celled organisms. You know, go down to Oh, you've got lots of water around here, right? <laughs> yeah. Go down to a pond, a stream, a lake, anything, and take a sample, put it under a microscope, and what do you find? You find all this amazing stuff, and all these little creatures thriving there. Uh, those are the background radiation of the Cambrian explosion. There's this huge diversity of protestant forms that were produced there, and when we look at them, what we discover is that they've all got little bits and pieces of the story of us in them. So we look at extant protists that we find ourselves reflected in the pieces. Now, I'm just going to give you a couple quick examples here. Uh, this is one of my favorite animals. It's a quantiflagellate. Uh, quantiflagellate are protists, single cell carrier organisms. Uh, they have a characteristic morphology. That is, there's a single cell, and it has a collar. You see the little collar there? Just a ring of, of uh, ciliated structures standing out there. And there's also a flagellum that's a central structure that's like a little whip. And they have a very simple lifestyle. They float the water column and the little whip twirls around and generates water currents and send water streaming back over the cell body and any food particles in the water are then caught by the collar and absorbed and digested. Very simple lifestyle. Interestingly, these animals have some surprising behaviors. Uh, they're single cell, but what they will occasionally do is they will occasionally team up. A couple of reasons they'll do that, uh, one is also right there, sometimes they'll form as little clusters. So they'll link up to each other, they'll actually make uh, protein connections between each other, and they'll sit there clinging to each other with their own little lips going out there, and, and the reason they do that is it makes them you know, more efficient filters. It sends more water streaming over the group. So it's cooperation doing good things for the cell. The other reason they'll do it is sometimes uh, these animals will migrate the water column up and down in the course of the day. And they will hitch up together and aim their flagella in the same direction. So it's like having multiple motors all helping them to get more efficiently wherever they're going. So they're single cell, but they occasionally get together and operate. That's pretty neat. 
Uh, I'll mention another one, one important fact about them. Uh, quadriflagellates, we found they're cousins. If you look at sponges, sponges are these little blobs with all these channels and tunnels going through them. And you look inside them, what you find are cells called planocytes, which just look like that. Only they're permanently hooked together. So sponges are like a bunch of quadriflagellates. They got together, set up permanent residence, built little homes, have lots of flagella, almost more efficiently filtering water and gathering food for the organism. Okay, so what do you have to do to do this? You have to build complexity, right? Single cell, simpler. Multi cell, more complex. I hope you agree. <laughs> so they've got to form a connection. How do they do that? Well, this was uh, another cool piece of the story. Um, if you take these animals and you sequence their genomes, yes, what's inside there? We got a surprise. When they sequence the genome, they're just expecting typical protistin sorts of structures in there. Uh, what they found is something that's very multicellular animal like. Uh, years ago, people would have classified us in a molecular sense by saying we have a certain set of proteins that other creatures don't. We have proteins that plants can have, for instance. And among these proteins are an obscure set of proteins called receptor tyrosine kinases. I've just lost the entire right body. Yeah, I'm like this stuff. Okay, receptor tyrosine kinases, they're easy to understand. Uh, the receptor part means that they have their protein that's on the surface of the cell, and they can bind stuff. They're sticky. They can bind to things. The other thing they've got is inside the cell, they've got a part of the structure called tyrosine kinase, which is just an enzyme. And what they do is if they stick to something in the environment, it activates the enzyme and starts switching things on inside the cell. So it's a simple way for a simple cell to find, oh, I bumped into something, turns on a set of genes that are appropriate for sticking to something. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. Um, what they found is, once upon a time, well, they, as I said, they, once upon a time they thought this was a characteristic of us because all of our cells, they have to stick together, right? So our skin cells have to stick to skin cells. And one of the things they use is receptor tyrosine kinase is to send signals and you're stuck to an appropriate cell. You're not stuck to a liver cell, you're stuck to another, another skin cell. So we thought these were unique multicellular animals. They found them in quadriflagellates. They also kind of figured out where they came from. Uh, that's what this phylogenetic tree down here is saying. Uh, that you look in plants, for instance, and they have a receptor, an EGF receptor. They also have a tyrosine kinase. They have the enzyme part, but they're separate. There was a fusion event that occurred in our ancestry just before the quadriflagellates and us multicellular and metazoan creatures diverged, where these fused. So this is how we added this new feature to us. We just two, took two existing proteins glued them together, and all of a sudden, we've got a switch, a signal, that the cell can use to tell when it's stuck to something. We found lots of things in these animals. So we once thought these were all you need to us multicellular animals. Receptor tires and kinase, I just mentioned, these signaling switches. Another one they found is our cadherins. Cadherins are another class of proteins that are involved in making cells sticky. And they're sticky in a selective way. They're only sticky when calcium is running out, and they loosen up when you remove calcium. And we use these a lot as our, in embryos, because one of the things that happens in our embryos is uh, cells have to move around. So there's all kinds of migration going along. So you've got to be free to move. And then once you reach your destination, you want to gel. You want to move yourself in place and be right there. So we, we're going with these cadherins. The quadriflagellates have them as well. And another curious one is integrins. So I mentioned we have proteins that stick cells to other cells. We also have proteins that stick cells 